Genesis isn't just America's youngest luxury brand, they're also one of the most agile. Not that long ago, the G80 was all new, and at that point in time, some reviewers said it had kind of a soft personality. It wasn't as sporty or as dynamic as some people might want. Enter the G80 Sport. This is the answer to the decidedly comfortable regular G80. This model has a retuned adaptive suspension system, optional summer tires, which this model has on it, optional rear wheel steering, which this model also has, and of course, a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6. Of course, for 2022, the G80 Sport is the only way to get the 3.5 liter twin turbo 6, but don't worry, this is sporty with a bit of a twist. No Genesis would be complete without this big Superman grille. We have the Genesis logo on top, radar sensor right there in the middle. Most of the change for the Sport happens at the lower portion of the bumper where we find a reworked grille and extra air intakes there. And then we have the very distinctive split LED headlights that we find in every Genesis currently. These wrap around from the front onto the side and then past the front wheels onto the rear and then around the back as well. The G80 competes in an interesting and shrinking segment in America, the midsize luxury sedan segment. Lexus doesn't even offer us an option here anymore, with the Lexus GS going off into the sunset, leaving us only the front-wheel drive Lexus ES. You could cross-shop this with the ES, of course, but you're going to get more power and definitely a different kind of vehicle, because design-wise, this is much more similar to a BMW 5 Series or a Mercedes-Benz E-Class than something like the Lexus or the Acura. For the US market, Genesis brings us two different engines. There's a base 2.5 liter four cylinder turbo that produces 300 horsepower and 311 pound feet of torque. That's a great engine if you want to save a little bit of money because it's one of the most powerful base engines in this segment. Although keep in mind that the G80 is a little on the heavy side. As we're taking a look at here with the optional 3.5 liter turbo that produces 375 horsepower, this is about 4,500 pounds. So about 500 pounds heavier than a BMW with a six cylinder turbo or about 150 pounds heavier than the Mercedes. Both engines are mated to a standard eight-speed automatic transmission and your choice of rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive if you choose the base engine. If you get the three and a half liter turbo, then all-wheel drive becomes standard. Part of why this model gets a relatively low fuel economy rating, 20 miles per gallon combined for this engine. If you get the two and a half liter turbo, you'll get 25 or 26 miles per gallon, depending on whether you choose rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. If you want an electric G80, there is one, and that's probably the way I would select my G80. It looks exactly like this sedan with a slightly different grille, and basically all the electronic systems borrowed out of the GV60. So 365 horsepower approximately, two electric motors, but there are a few compromises on the inside. Now there's gonna be a separate video on the G80 Electrified just as soon as I can get my hands on it, but I will talk a little bit about it on the inside. After a week with the G80, I found front seat comfort to be excellent, but this driver's seat is an example of how Genesis gets to their excellent value proposition. The G80 is definitely less expensive than a 5 Series or an E-Class, one of the ways Genesis gets there is by carefully selecting the features that we find on the inside. So over here on the driver's side, we find a multi-way power driver's seat with dynamically inflatable bolsters, power extending thigh cushion, four-way adjustable lumbar support, etc all linked to a two position memory, and then we have a power tilt telescopic steering column. But the passenger seat, it's not the same as the driver's seat. It doesn't have the massage functionality, doesn't have the power extending thigh cushion, inflatable bolsters, etc. Obviously that increases the value proposition for the G80, but if your front passenger is looking for the same sort of comfort that the driver gets, you might need to shop somewhere else. Jumping into the back seat, we find tons of legroom. This front seat was adjusted for me at six feet tall. I then got out of the car and the easy exit seat moved it two inches further rearward. And as you can see, I still have about four or five inches of legroom left. We have about three and a half inches more combined legroom in here than we find in the five series or the E-Class thanks to the size of the GV80. Likely another reason that we get a bit more room inside is that the hood seems to be just a tiny bit shorter in the GV80. It's likely that this was not designed for a long inline engine like we do find in the current generation E-Class and 5 Series. There's a pretty decent driveline hump, just as you'd expect in a rear wheel drive sedan. And this center seat position is certainly higher off the ground than the more bucket shaped outboard seating positions, meaning that an adult here in the middle might be a little bit tight. But scooting over here to the right side where this seat is all the way back in its tracks, I still have about three inches of legroom left. If you're debating between a regular G80 and the electric G80, one important thing to keep in mind is that the rear seats do change if you get the electrified model because of where they had to put the batteries. So we lose about an inch of headroom. If I lean back here, put my head against the headrest, my hair is just barely brushing against the ceiling, but I have about three quarters of an inch of headroom left. 
I suspect in the electric G80, my head would be touching the ceiling. Also, you lose about three inches of legroom, so my knees would be touching this front seat back in the electric model. Behind the Shapely Power trunk lid, we find just over 13 cubic feet of storage space. The button is integrated right there into that rear camera module. This cargo area is sort of mid-pack for the mid-size luxury sedan segment. It's right about the same as the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, but definitely smaller than the BMW 5 Series. That has a pretty big cargo area. Now, if you get the electric G80, then the trunk shrinks by about three cubic feet, putting it really on the small side for this segment. Thankfully, this cargo area is very square though, so I was able to fit five 24-inch roller bags in here, and if we pull up the load floor, there is a unicorn for a luxury vehicle in the US these days. There's actually a compact spare tire down here, something that we generally don't find in most of the European options. This spare tire is likely part of the reason that this cargo area is a little bit smaller than some of the Germans, but I think that's a worthwhile trade. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is the top end trim, so there are features in here like this imitation suede headliner that we don't find in in the base model. We have this large panoramic moonroof, but the entire roof doesn't open. You can see it stops right there, and then there is that support bar across the back. It extends to just about the rear passenger's laps. Here you can see those rear door panels and the manual shades. As you'd expect out of a vehicle in this segment, the rear door panels and the front door panels have the same level of precision as far as their construction and the same sort of materials going on as well. In this model, we have a carbon fiber trim insert right there in the door. You can see the ambient lighting down there in that door pocket. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, four-way adjustable headrests, and a very attractive leather upholstery interior. One cool touch that we find on a lot of Genesis vehicles are these buttons right here on the front passenger seat. That makes it easier to move it forward and backward if you have folks hopping in the rear and you need to scoot that seat forward. You can see that sort of herringbone pattern in the leather there. These seats are ventilated and heated, so they're perforations in the leather. Moving over to the doors, we definitely find some more hard plastics right here for this pillar between the front and rear doors than we find in some of the European competition. I do think that that is a little bit of a misstep. I kind of wish that they had given that the same sort of soft touch materials we find on the doors on either side. But the front doors, again, are very nicely done. You can see the speaker grills there. This one has the optional audio system from Lexicon. It's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but there's more ambient lighting going on on the front door storage pocket, but we don't find the same sort of crazy light pipes and things like that that we find in the Germans as far as the ambient lighting goes. Again, lots of soft touch materials going on here. And if we zoom in on this carbon fiber trim, you can see that it has a really unique weave pattern to it that I find really cool. You should know that there aren't as many interior color combinations, trim combinations, etc., available in Genesis vehicles. That's one of the ways they get to the value proposition in their vehicles as well, by having fewer options. So more options bundling, more options packages, fewer standalone options, and less ways to customize the interior of your vehicle. If that's something that you're into, you might want to look somewhere else. Moving over here to the passenger side, again, lots of soft touch materials, big bin style glove compartment. I had no problem fitting a large tablet computer inside. You can see that ambient light strip right under there. And then what looks like one large air vent that runs right across the dashboard, but this really is just a trim effect. But they have integrated the outside of the air vent into the upper stitch section of the dashboard and this trim. It's kind of a neat, sleek look there. And that happens whether we get the carbon fiber trim or the wood trim on the inside. In the middle of the dashboard, we have an extremely wide infotainment screen. This is a touchscreen unit, even though it is pretty far away from the driver and the front passenger. So depending on exactly what you're doing, it may be a little bit easier to stab the screen. I love the fact that even though this is set high and far on the dash, the Genesis gives you that option to touch the screen if that's what you want to do. Likely because of the width of this screen, CarPlay and Android Auto integration won't use the entire display, leaving the other side left for you to swipe through different features. So for instance, weather there, you can also swipe up and down for things like the factory mapping, clock, things like that. Moving back to the system's native interface, interacting with the unit is very responsive, whether we're going from the navigation system to the navigation menus, etc. Everything is pretty snappy in here. Genesis doesn't offer quite as many connected service options as we find in some of the European vehicles, but I don't find that to be too much of a problem because I end up using CarPlay most of the time. Let me know what you think about that, of course, down there. Moving down the dashboard, we find the hazard light button well integrated in that trim a row of physical buttons for the infotainment system. You can see there's a favorite button, setup button, etc. Those are a little bit difficult to read in strong light. Then down from there, we find the controls for the front two climate control zones, and then there's a button in that touch system to control the rear climate control zone. Just below that, we find this little sliding cubby where we can store our smartphone. There's a Qi wireless charging mat in there and a USB input. 
Below that, we have some of the controls for the infotainment system here. You can see we have a scroll wheel style knob for the power and volume. There's a little tuning wheel there, and then menu, home, and back buttons for the infotainment system. Back on the driver's side, we have one of two available LCD instrument clusters. The base model is going to be an 8-inch display with some physical gauges. I do think that's a little bit small for this segment. And then this is the top-end one with 3D functionality. It's a little bit difficult to see exactly how this works on camera, so you'll just have to trust me on this or go see one in person. These two purple light lights up here are part of the driver monitoring system. They're not visible to the naked eye. What they're doing is not only making sure that the driver is paying attention to the road, but also they're tracking the eye movements of the driver. So it knows exactly where to place the stacked images on the screen to give this a 3D effect. And the 3D effect is very, very noticeable in this particular layout especially. An interesting thing about Genesis design philosophy is that their vehicles don't look like Russian nesting dolls in the way the Germans do. So we have a different steering wheel than we find really in the rest of the Genesis lineup. A lot of Genesis models have two spoke wheels. This one has a three spoke design with the split bottom spoke. And even the buttons on either side are not the same sort of technology or the same style in each model. We have paddle shifters on the back. And then these are a combination of physical buttons and knobs and then touch elements. So we have a little roller right there for the options. It clicks down to OK. Very similar over there for the infotainment controls. And then these buttons are touch sensitive, but you can see the entire button module moves. It knows which option you selected because of the one you were touching Will that button module engaged. One thing that surprised me, we don't have a flat bottom steering wheel in the Sport model. When I first posted about the G80 Sport on Facebook, some folks were asking, is this the Genesis corollary to the entry-level AMG models? Sort of yes and no. Obviously, this is the fastest version of the G80. If I floor this, we'll go 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds, and the transmission has a pretty aggressive tune to it if I'm in any of the sportier modes. The shifts are not as harsh as the 9-speed automatic transmission, however, that we find in the Mercedes lineup. It's always pretty civilized and pretty smooth. But Genesis decided not to make the rest of the G80 quite as hardcore as even an entry-level AMG. In my 60-0 stopping test, it took just 105 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That is an excellent stopping distance for what is a pretty big luxury sedan. Over the week that I've been driving this G80, I'm constantly forced to think, this is the vehicle that Lexus could have built and should have built, but for some reason they just didn't want to. The V6 engine has a great exhaust note. It's pretty muted. The cabin is nice and isolated. The seats are comfortable. Right now I'm getting a very gentle massage on my lower back. The steering has a precision to it and the braking has a precision to it that we don't find in all of the options in this segment. It has a very Germanic feel in that respect. But the suspension tune definitely marches to a different drummer. Again, this is not a copy of a 5 Series or an E-Class. It charts its own course and one that I find is a good middle way between some of the other options out there. This is going to be more reliable than a Jaguar XF, of course, but it reminds me of the way the XF feels out on the road, too. It has a solid feel to it, comfortable handling, confident handling as well. This always feels like you're in control, and with the summer tires, the amount of grip is just excellent. Yes, the suspension is tuned on the softer side of things, and yes, I can firm it up a little bit. I can put it in Sport Plus, or I could, of course, put it in the custom drive mode and adjust things, but it always is going to be a little bit softer than something like a BMW M540i or a Mercedes-Benz E53 AMG, something along those lines. I like this balance. I think that this is a better balance than we find in the Germans. Some of those options come across as just a little bit too harsh for a daily driver or a highway road trip car. Exactly the kind of thing that you want to do in the G80. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give this an A. Clearly there are options that are going to grip the road a little bit better. This has positively excellent grip, however. This is absolutely world class, but there are a few that are just a little bit better. There are certainly some of the German options, most notably the 540 with the appropriate options and the Mercedes AMG with the appropriate options that are going to have slightly more polished if you're really pushing it out on a rough road, etc. But the difference is going to be incredibly small. And this is priced a bit more like a Lexus ES or perhaps a TLX Type S, and this just absolutely blows them out of the water. With the balance of performance, capability, handling, etc., and the ride quality, it's really, really well done. This has the ride quality and cabin quietness to rival the Lexus ES, but the handling ability to really compete with the Germans. It's a really good combination. One of the things that I've always appreciated about the Genesis brand is that when it comes to suspension tuning, they don't simply carbon copy BMW or any of the Germans. 
So the G80 has a distinctive ride quality of its very own. This definitely feels bigger and heavier sometimes than you might imagine. It has more of a classic luxury car ride. And therefore, I would say that even in this sporty model, the ride is simply the best in this segment in the luxury group, even including versions of the BMW 5 Series or the Mercedes-Benz E-Class that have adaptive suspensions or the air suspensions that we find in some of the competition as well. This soaks up large imperfections and small imperfections very well. And even if I move this over to Sport Plus, where we have the most aggressive suspension tune, it's still pretty comfortable in here. Now going over some of these potholes, you're definitely gonna notice them. And definitely we have a firmer suspension tune, less tip and dive, et cetera, than you get in the regular modes, but it's very well controlled and very well balanced. And most importantly, always luxurious. Now, unfortunately, every cloud seems to have, you know, a little lightning bolt trying to come out of it rather than a silver lining. And for the G80, that is fuel economy. That is this vehicle's Achilles heel. I had hoped that with a new engine design, this 3.5 liter V6 is pretty darn new, that they really would have focused more on fuel economy, and that doesn't appear to be overly high on Genesis' priority list. If you want a more efficient vehicle, there's an electric vehicle in the lineup that they could sell you. If you want this kind of performance, you're gonna to have to pay. This model's been averaging about 19 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving, although I have been having a lot of fun with it, so keep that in mind. If you get the 2.5 liter, 300 approximate horsepower engine, that is a lot of fun. I think that might be where I would go because it's a great value. That's gonna get you between 25 and 26 miles per gallon combined. But the Germans, they're really gonna be a lot more efficient than this when we're talking about similar amounts of performance, similar amounts of power. Now, about that rear steering system, it does have a positive impact, not just on handling, but also in parking lot maneuvers. It shrinks the turning diameter of this vehicle from 38.1 feet down to 36.2. That may not sound like a great deal, but in a tight parking lot situation, you will definitely notice the impact. The rear steer is not quite as aggressive as we find on some Mercedes models with this particular feature, but it does the same excellent job here in the G80. Bottom line out on the road, the G80 is just an absolute blast to drive. And again, I think an absolutely perfect balance. This fits my personality the best of all of the luxury segment vehicles that are currently available with the exception of that fuel economy figure. And that is a big consideration for a lot of folks. This is a lot of fun, but it's going to cost you more to fill up long-term than something like the S90 plug-in hybrid or really any of the German competition as well. On the other hand, if you're willing to pay the fuel bill, the G80 rewards with excellent handling and a well-polished ride. Now let's talk about what Genesis got right and where they still need to do their homework. First up, design. I think that the G80 is beautiful inside and outside, but I also like the fact that it has a unique style to its own. And that's not what we first saw when Hyundai tried to create their very first luxury sedan, the original Genesis model. It really was a mishmash of styles. It wasn't cohesively one thing or the other, but that is distinctively different in the G80. I also love the fact that they have a powerful engine lineup. They really went a little beyond their comfort zone and gave us that 2.5 liter turbocharged engine standard, lots of standard horsepower, something that we don't find in all the competition, especially if you're gonna compare the G80 against something like a Lexus ES, which you logically could, or a Volvo S90, there are definitely less powerful engines available in those models. Also a big win is the infotainment system. Now, this is a bit polarizing because the software on the infotainment system is largely the same behind the scenes as other models from the Hyundai and Kia conglomerate, but it's been reskinned for Genesis and it's very easy to use. And that's the big thing here is that it's easy to use, it's intuitive, and it has an attractive look. If, however, you want something that's more fully featured or more unique to a luxury vehicle, you might wanna shop elsewhere, but there are pros and cons to this. A lot of luxury car companies, their software tends to be buggy, it tends to be unintuitive, so being related to a mainstream product is actually a bit of an advantage here for the G80. Also, obviously, the spacious and comfortable interior. That's a big win here. Lots more legroom even than you'll find in a Lexus ES. If you're looking for a comfortable vehicle in this segment, especially for rear seat passengers, child seats, taller folks in the back, you wanna take a look at the G80. It has a really big back seat. Now let's talk about the things that Genesis should work on. First up, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's not available in the G80. We don't know whether it's coming via a software update or whether that's even possible or not, but it's not here now. I'm not overly bothered by that. I prefer to plug in anyway, but for some reason, everybody else I talked to this week thought it was an absolute misstep that Genesis did not include that feature. Also keep in mind, 
the G80 is not as customizable as the European options. So if you want top level features with the base engine, you're going to have to look elsewhere because that does not happen in the Genesis lineup. Genesis is really targeting the value proposition and that really means keeping those options very focused and definitely in distinct packages. Also, fuel economy is not especially great with either engine. You will definitely find significantly higher fuel economy in the competition. In the segment the G80 is playing in, there are a number of hybrids and plug-in hybrids available, and they will give you better fuel economy, and some of them will give you better performance as well. But six-cylinder turbo to six-cylinder turbo, the difference is not going to be enormous, but we still find lower fuel economy in the Genesis, and that's something that I really had hoped they would work on, but they don't appear to have made that a particular focus in this generation. Last awkward thing, the back seat doesn't fold, and I do find that really peculiar because this is about the only entry in this segment that does not have that particular feature. There are a few rare exceptions, but generally speaking, everybody else has a folding back seat, and that really makes this a lot less cargo practical than anything with that folding functionality because you simply cannot put larger items in there. There's a tiny ski pass-through, that's all we get, no folding back seat. But keeping that in mind, the G80 is much less expensive than most of the competition. It doesn't appear that right off the bat sometimes, because 48250 does not sound too far off necessarily the maybe $54,000, $55,000 price point of some of the German options. But when you start taking a look at the feature content you get standard in the Genesis, it's obvious it's a lot less expensive. There is no Lexus direct competitor at the moment, and you could see something like a Volvo S90 as a competitor, although driving dynamics wise, the G80 is in a different category, which is why it's not on this list. Try as hard as you might, the G80 is only going to go up to about $72,000 for the 3.5 liter turbo engine. Whereas a Mercedes-Benz E55 is going to go all the way up to 108, the 5 Series is going to get to 84, and the A6 or S6, I should say, is going to get all the way up there to about $105,000. Now, you might be wondering, why did I stop at the BMW 540? That's mainly based on performance statistics. If you want to go 0 to 60 in about 4.2 to 4.4 seconds, you have to get the E55 to do that. The next level down in the lineup is not quite that quick. Whereas in the BMW lineup, the twin turbo V8 is significantly faster. It's well below four seconds. That price tag is going to be up there towards about $108,000. But zero to 60 time, the top end models on this chart are relatively close together. And that's why I chose them. Even if you were to select that next level down in the Mercedes-Benz lineup and give up just a tiny bit of performance, it's going to be significantly more expensive, comparably equipped to the G80. And that really is the G80's bottom line. It's been posting excellent reliability ratings. The fuel economy is a little mediocre, but it comes back with a very strong value proposition and a very distinctive style and distinctive presence of its own. If I were shopping for a luxury sedan in this segment right now, and I could see myself doing that if I had a long daily commute at some point, I would certainly put the G80 at the top of my shopping list. Whether I would get a G80 or a plug-in hybrid alternative, I'm not sure. But if you're considering that and you're torn, then be sure and check out the Genesis G80 Electric because that's going to give you nearly 300 miles of range, even better performance, electric all-wheel drive, and essentially the rest of the same package. I'm going to be driving that one over the next few weeks, so be sure and stay tuned for that video. You're going to find that one over at EV Buyer's Guide. If you haven't already subscribed to that channel, be sure and click that subscribe button. You'll find it at the end of the video somewhere on the screen. I'll see all of you later, and let me know what would you shop for in this segment, especially if you're looking to spend maybe $60,000, right in the middle of the G80's price range. You're not going to get a BMW or a Mercedes or an Audi with nearly the same kind of feature set, but they are going to have a slightly more premium dealer experience and logically a more premium logo on the hood. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section as well. I'll see all of you later.